Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. At all levels of the organization, just to share some fun facts here, in 2022, 46% of our U.S. workforce was female and 30% of our U.S. vice presidents and above, so people who are in leadership roles in the U.S. and 28% globally, which is a phenomenal statistic, are women. Now, am I satisfied at 28 or 30%? No, (laughs) but the growth is just tremendous because we continue to see year-over-year increases in the percentage of women in leadership. That was Clover Network's CMO, Andrea Gellert, and she is my special guest on this episode, episode 237 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Andrea earned her very first dollar selling avocados with her neighborhood friend. So how did she wind up in payments? You'll have to tune in to find out. But spoiler alert, it was a tough choice between deodorant and financial technology. Andrea is here to help me kick off our annual Women Leaders in Payments Month. Clover is the leading cloud-based POS solution for small and medium-sized businesses in the U.S. They offer a front office solution for payment acceptance, as well as a technology platform for business management. Andrea and I spent some time talking about her most eye-opening moments throughout her career, as well as her journey to the role of CMO. We also discussed the most powerful lessons she learned from a round of constructive criticism that continues to influence her management style even to this day. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Andrea. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. And more specifically, thank you for participating during Women Leaders in Payments Month. Hi, Greg. It's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. Absolutely. So first, tell our audience about your role today and then we'll kind of rewind and talk about your journey to where you are today. Absolutely. So I am currently the Chief Marketing Officer of Clover. And for those of people who don't know what Clover is, we are the leading cloud-based point of sale solution for small and medium-sized businesses in the United States. So when you go to pay for something and you want to use your card or any other form of payment, that's kind of what a point of sale solution does. And it manages not just the that kind of front office activity of taking payments, but also really provides an overall business platform for small businesses. So that's what Clover is. And we're a part of Fiserv, which is a global financial services technology provider. Great. So where did you grow up and what was your life like growing up? I grew up in Los Angeles. So I am a California girl at heart and had a, had a really great childhood, you know, LA in the seventies and early eighties was a, was a very special place. It was still more, I would say small town than large city. And I grew up in, I would say pretty progressive environment, very oriented towards Girl power oriented, both at school and at home. Spent a lot of time, as you can imagine, outdoors. I I love the outdoors and kind of try to keep some of that LA-ness about me at all times. So when you were growing up, were you more like the lemonade stand builder, the entrepreneur type, or were you more like the planner or organizer of the Friday night out with friends? You know, Greg, I was a little bit of both. I actually earned my very first dollar selling avocados with a friend of mine, a neighbor of mine who lived up the street and she had avocado trees in the backyard. And we set up the equivalent of a lemonade stand, but for avocados nice. in, on, on the corner in our neighborhood. But I was also a, an organizer. I think I tend to be a fairly structured person and I do like to corral people. So I, I think, you know, I was also a bit of the, definitely the planner for sure. Okay. Okay, great. So next question is around your very first job. So I always like to share mine's kind of a a unique story. My mother worked at a university, a small college in Birmingham, Alabama, and I was 15 and they needed a person to wash the pots and pans in the cafeteria. (laughs) So that was my first job when I was 15, went to work at 10 and got off at two during the summer and washed pots and pans. So curious curious what your very first job was. My very first job was, I would say, equally mundane. I worked in a clothing store, but I didn't actually get to work in the store itself. I was working in the warehouse behind, you know, this clothing store where we 
basically had to spend all of our time unpacking boxes of jeans and shirts and other clothing. And then we had to tag everything to get it ready to be put out in the store and merchandised in the store. And I think my biggest lesson there, which came as a real shock to me, was just how marked up retail prices are. <laughs> the difference between wholesale prices and resale prices, something I learned at a really early age. I was in probably... I probably had just finished my sophomore year in high school. And then my other fun job, which was, I guess, my second job, but not my first job, was that I was a, an early barista, which is somewhat ironic because I'm actually a tea drinker. I'm not a coffee drinker, but I spent an entire summer telling people about, you know, the difference between a espresso and, a, you know, a latte and that this type of coffee bean, because we sold all different types of coffee bean, like this type of coffee bean tasted more like chocolate with notes of whatever cinnamon and this other type of coffee bean tasted, you know, stronger and smokier. And I, of course, didn't taste any of the coffee and had no <laughs> idea what they tasted like. Nice. That's funny. Well, let's let's switch gears and go back and talk about Clover a little bit. I want to make sure we we dive deeper. You mentioned a little bit about Clover at a high level, but I wanted you to maybe tell us a little more about what Clover does. So we're really a point of sale and business management platform. So like I said, we we offer not only just payments acceptance, but we also support running a business owner day-to-day operations. It, it, as you can imagine, we have very robust hardware for point of sale devices and, and very flexible payment solutions. But what business owners need is to be able to connect the dots across all of their businesses, right? Their business operations. So they have employees they need to manage. They have customers they need to manage and market to. They have inventory and items that they, they need to keep track of. And so when you think about it, whether or not you're a restaurant or retailer or a service provider, all of these like financial management, customer management and employee management needs are very much connected to payments. And so Clover provides a unique platform to enable businesses to really run and grow and operate their businesses in a way that is super intuitive and flexible and, and all in the cloud. So it's easy to keep up to date. Yeah, I've always thought of Clover as sort of like an operating system for a business, right? It's what a business uses to run their business. And correct me if I'm wrong, not only does it have a lot of the software components, like you mentioned, the inventory management, people management, all that. Also, there's hardware, right? Right. We're very proud of our hardware, not just because it looks great, which it does and can survive, you know, crazy hot temperatures and crazy cold temperatures and being bounced around. We actually have a a great facility that I've been to that shows all the different tests that we put our hardware through. But you can also do a lot of business operations actually in the hardware itself. So it has its own software connected to it. And I think that that's an evolution we've been making at Clover where I think we initially were really known for our hardware solution, but we are equally becoming known for and quite frankly have have real power in the software that we provide. And so, you know, creating different points of, of software access, whether or not it's desktop, in mobile, on the device itself, is something that is really important because businesses need to be able to operate their business wherever and however they need to. And so we want to make sure that that's all part of the ecosystem that we offer. Is it fair to say that Clover is sort of the small business brand within the larger Fiserv company? It certainly is from a merchant services perspective. You know, clearly on you know Fiserv, we offer a lot of core banking platforms and we offer core banking platforms that support small business operations in the institutions, the financial institutions that we support. But when it comes to merchants and payments and point of sale, Clover is the, the brand for that at, at Fiserv. Okay. And what would you say differentiates Clover from your competitors? <laughs> We're just simply better, Greg. You know, I think the head of our business, my boss, I think said it best, which is that we have the best combination of service solution and value in the market. You know, our platform provides tremendous flexibility across the applications that you can load into it, the software packages we have, the flexibility of our hardware. We also have a really differentiated services model. We have actual people on the street, over 6,000 people in market there to do nothing but support our merchants and help them get the most out of our services. And then we're very focused on championing small businesses in the communities that they are in. You know, we know and understand just how much grit and determination it takes to run a small business. And that really inspires and motivates us. And so we invest with and invest in and partner with community organizations that support small businesses. We have 
small business incubators and grant programs and other developmental resources. And we do this through partnerships like our Back to Business Grant Program, but we also have programs like our Clover Academy and our blog to really help educate merchants in areas that we know they need help on. And listen, underpinning all of this is that we have the backing of Pfizer, which is a global powerhouse, right? And recognized leader known for consistency and stability. And so we have this just amazing commitment to provide, I would say, like an enterprise grade solution to small business, which is completely differentiates us in the market. And being somewhat of a of an outsider, although I'm a payments person, I've always seen Clover as being, you know, having the relationships with their merchants as opposed to, you know, a, a lot of payments companies can fall into the trap of being very transactional, right? They see it as clicks as opposed to relationships. And I've always thought Clover sort of had that you kind of named all the things you do to support the communities and support the small businesses. So to me, you know, the way I compartmentalize it is that it's very relationship oriented as opposed to transaction oriented. I like the way they, you say that, Greg, that might be my, my new favorite way of describing why we're better. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. We believe in having a human connection with our businesses, and we do that both both in terms of accessibility, right, to people here at our company and the accountability that people here have to small businesses, and also just, you know, making sure that our, our product is intuitive, right, and feels like a human designed it, right, somebody who understands what a restaurant needs or what a retailer needs or what, a, you know, a gym needs. That's our, our way of showing up as, as human as well. So where do you see the payments industry headed, say, in the next two to three years? You know, I think that in the next couple of years, it's, it's really going to be about convenience, how to streamline that, that customer journey. How do you eliminate as many you know, barriers to customers buying as possible, right? Because the less friction, the better. I think trends like omnicommerce will continue to grow and expand. Consumers are just expecting it to be easy to buy whenever I buy, whenever I want to, however I want to, with whatever payment I want to, whether or not that's Apple Pay or we just launched Apple Tap to Pay, or in addition to digital wallets, it's buy now, pay later. It it could be different forms of currency. So I I think whether or not it's online or offline, I I think that absolutely those trends are are going to continue. They've already started, but we're seeing them accelerate. I also think this notion of improved security practices are going to be really important. We all are thinking about data and privacy and and system security. And I think people want to make sure that their systems are keeping up and staying ahead of the trends to make sure they're not inadvertently in a cyber situation or in a fraud situation. And so we are obviously doing a lot of things and we already do as part of Fiserv to, like I said, part of our kind of enterprise grade is our focus there. But I think that's going to continue as well. Any thoughts about maybe get the crystal ball out and say 10 years from now, where do you think things are headed? From a payments perspective or from a, like how people are buying perspective? or, or Yeah, I mean, I think it's all commerce, right? I mean, what what changes do you see happening in the 10, you know, there there are things like, I thought we were headed down a path where crypto was going to become a method of payment. And we've seen that practically stop, right? I mean, it's more now of just a, a of a potential investment and, and the whole concept of using crypto to buy everyday things is maybe going to happen in 10 years, but that has slowed down and blockchain being part of business, maybe not so much in the small business space, but, but certainly in payments overall. And, you know, you mentioned some of them that I think are two or three year things, but they're also 10 year things is continuing to remove friction from the buying process. There's still tons of friction in times when certain payment type things don't work and you, you just kind of scratch your head. And and that's even with large companies, you know, thinking of larger franchises and things where you would expect a simple payment to work and it doesn't. So, I mean, I think those are the type of things that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about. It's funny, when I, when I try to think about where things are going to be 10 years out, I tend to look at my kids who are sort of young adults at this point and look at how they view the world and, and how they move around the world. And I think for the most part, they don't, they don't even need a physical wallet anymore. Everything's on their phone. And I don't know where that takes us in 10 years, but I think that trend of you're just going to be connected constantly and in real time to the transactions you want to make 
and the things you want to buy, you know, it's moved already from their phones to their watches and who knows where we'll go from, from there. But I think this being tethered to a desktop, being tethered to a computer, being tethered to a physical wallet is only going to get more and more diffuse in the next 10 years. Yeah, I think that's all I could commit to on the on the table. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I've always said as as soon as all the states go to a digital type driver's license, where you can you know show your driver's license on your phone, that'll be the day when no one carries a wallet anymore, right? You know, but it's starting. Yeah, it's it's going to be here for our kids, no doubt. Right. All right, well, let's let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you and, and sort of your background. So tell us about your journey, how you became the CMO at Clover, maybe a little bit about your background and then how you got to Clover. Sure. <laughs> I'm really, I'm really old, Greg. How much time do you have? <laughs> so <laughs> listen, I joined American Express as a summer intern. I had been making the decision as a summer intern about whether or not I wanted to uh, go to American Express and focus on financial services or go to a consumer packaged goods company. And I was really struggling with the decision, but I came to New York to talk to both companies. And at American Express, I was going to be, the summer job was to be working at what's now open. So the small business services group, which really was a card issuer. So it was, it was all about issuing charge cards for, for small businesses And the other opportunity I had, and I won't name the company, was to, you know, was to work on some on on some type of consumer product. And the the person who I had spent the most time with, who I I think the job was going to be with, was responsible for deodorant. And I walked into this this gentleman's office, and he had deodorant everywhere, right? Because he was (laughs) product manager for deodorant. And I remember thinking, you know, listen, I think deodorant is provides value in this world, but I don't think I want to spend my time thinking about shelf, you know, shelf feet and shelf space of deodorant. I like this idea of having a longer term value proposition to focus on and and how do you develop a, a, a deeper relationship with a customer over time because you're so integral to their day-to-day kind of operation or their day-to-day business model. And so I ended up making that call and I didn't expect that that was going to be my my decision actually, Greg. I thought for sure I would do the consumer products thing. That that was had been my focus at graduate school. I really thought I was going that direction. So I surprised myself by switching gears and ended up spending 15 terrific years at American Express. I, I worked my way up in marketing and strategy and account development functions across both open as well as the, the merchant services division. And then from there, I made my way through other companies. I really wanted to take a turn in earlier stage companies and spent several years in early stage companies, ultimately becoming the chief marketing and revenue officer of OnDeck, which was a a pioneer in the online lending business industry for small businesses. And then I joined Clover in 2021. So that's the five second overview of of (laughs) my career. So what drew you to Clover? I really... Think of myself as a, I would say, sort of a full stack marketer. I have experience across the full spectrum of marketing from brand, earned media, PR, to growth marketing, to product marketing, to lifecycle marketing, to marketing operations. And the opportunity to become the CMO of Clover and really bring my expertise in those areas to a business that was still in financial technology, but had this really interesting combination of hardware and software to support small business was really motivating for me and really exciting for me. And so, you know, at a time where Clover was was shifting its go-to-market focus from being solely focused on on channel partners to creating a more direct relationship with small businesses. And so for me, it was very much a kind of a, a, a white space like entrepreneurial opportunity, which I just thought was a great combination of having the backing of a large company, but really with a more innovator orientation and entrepreneurial orientation with Clover, as well as this full stack marketing opportunity. And so that that's what really drew me here. We've all heard the terms embedded payments or integrated payments. And of course, it's a huge trend in our industry. But the truth is, there's so much more to the story. So in collaboration with NMI, the fully integrated payment solution built to scale, we've launched the Be Solid campaign, where we're exploring embedded finance with guests from leading companies like KeyBank, Bain Capital Ventures, and more. To listen to the latest episodes, visit leadersinpayments.com or nmi.com slash resources slash podcasts. 
In a world full of squares and stripes, be solid. Obviously, you've been very successful throughout your career. So what are some of your guiding principles? I have a few. I think the first one is always make sure you have defined goals, right? You've got to know what the end game is. You have to start with the end in mind. And so make sure that you've got defined goals. And if you don't, if you're in a situation that feels ambiguous, like get the clarity, make sure that there is clarity because that's important, not just for you, but for your team, for your business partners and the like. So that's the first one. The second one is pay attention to the customer. I know that sounds really basic, but it can be harder to keep yourself focused on the customer than you think, right? Because the work can sometimes get in the way or different teams can get in the way or different challenges can get in the way. And it's it's easy to get caught up in the product or the numbers or whatever and lose sight of who your customers are and what's happening with them and what your competition is doing, you know, to help them or, or not help them. So second one is definitely pay attention to the customer. The third is about empowering your team. I mean, I, I was, like I said, was really fortunate to grow up at a company that like American Express that really believed in professional development and coaching, coaching and training development. And so I think there's the side of empowerment from a team perspective, which is about strategy and setting a vision, you know, that it's important that people on your team know what winning looks like. So that's the first part of empowerment. But the second part of empowerment is the coaching and the ongoing feedback and training and development that then you provide your team to help them achieve their goals. So, so that's really the third one is around empowerment. And then the last one, I think is just, you know, be human, right? Where we all get up, you know, in the morning and sort of get, get dressed and get to work and have other things, you know, in our lives. And, and so bring all of yourself to work and, and be human and, you know, support the people around you from a, an empathy perspective, I think is the last one. Yeah, I love that one. Be human. That's that's great. I did want to double click on the first one, the goals a little bit, just curious. So is it something that you're you're very prescriptive? Do you do you write them down on a daily, monthly, weekly, quarterly, annual basis? Like what what is when you say, you know, set goals, have that end end game in mind, kind of define that a little if you can. I think you have to draft a little bit about off about sort of how your your company operates, right? But I've been in environments that had six month goals, which I thought was really interesting. I've been in environments that have annual goals. I, either way, you know, from my perspective, you've got to break that down into, at this point, I would say quarterly goals. Although again, it depends a little bit on the function. If you're in a growth marketing team where you're providing leads and acquisition, you know, that's a monthly, <laughs> that's more yeah. of a monthly goal. So, so you've got to tailor the, the individual goals to, you know, the type of work that's happening on your team. But yes, I mean, to, I really believe in goals that are both qualitative and quantitative. So it's what we're going to do and how we're going to measure it. And so, because the KPIs are just super important, right? Like we can launch something and we can have a spectacular launch, but if it doesn't actually deliver the revenue or deliver the numbers, then then the launch wasn't that spectacular, was it? So it's quarterly at a minimum for most of the team, monthly, like I said, for for more like performance marketing folks. And then obviously their milestone goes. If you really are doing a big go-to-market launch, there, there's going to be goals around specific milestones. What I don't do is just have an annual goal and then try to track it from a, like a year-to-date, how are we tracking against the annual goal? I, I think that that's... In my experience, it allows for too much slippage. It allows for too much, oh, we can make up for it next month. We can make up for it at the end of the year. That's why I just prefer, I would say, shorter term goals in service to a potential longer term goal. But you got to have both in my mind. Okay. Well, I think most of us have had, you know, a few eye-opening moments in our careers. So maybe could you share a few of those that you've had in your career? Sure. I think some are personal and some are more about the work. So if I start with one that's more about the work, when I left American Express after being there for 15 years, and you know it's a 50, 60,000 person company, very large, very structured, and went to my first startup, which was the opposite. It was 70 people in a loft in Soho, had no structure, which was part of the reason why I was brought in. And I guess what was so eye-opening for me was, you know, how at that size, 
you know, every person really matters. And you have to make sure that people's attentions are focused because it can be, you know, people like being in startup environments because there's lots of possibility, which is great. There's lots of possibility, but you can't explore every possibility. Otherwise your efforts get diffused. You can't advance the business. And so it was that real eye-opening experience where it was like tons of exuberance and excitement, but then also a bit of chaos. And so how do you create some structure so there's not as much chaos without losing the energy and excitement and, you know, what it means to be in an entrepreneurial environment, I think was, was a really eye-opening experience for me. I think, you know, it was also really eye-opening because it's where I first learned about kind of just how, kind of how tech kind of truly works, you know, what it means to be so close to rapid innovation and that kind of pace of change. And what I've really kept from that experience is how to create that energy, regardless of the size of the company that, that I'm at. So I think that was my, my first, I would say like one eye-opening experience I've had. The other eye-opening experience I had, I've had this throughout, you know, my, my career is whenever you get constructive, you know, or critical feedback. I remember when I was first managing people and my leader, who was a fairly formidable woman, sat me down at some point and said, Andrea, every time you're in my office and you have somebody in your team going over kind of an update and I ask them a question and they start to stumble with the answer, you, you cut right in and answer for them. And I know that you think you are trying to be helpful because you're trying to get me the answer that I'm, you know, an answer to my question, but you're actually not being helpful because you're not giving the manager on your team the opportunity to kind of work through it on their own, figure out how to get over their nervousness, figure out how to articulate, maybe figure out that they weren't as prepared as they should have been. You need to let them go through that experience on their own, even if it's uncomfortable for you. And that has been something that has stayed with me. And I've I've tried to to remember that as often as possible. And I'm not so sure I get it right? A hundred percent of the time I still probably, you know, cut in just because that's, that's my nature. But I try to remember the, the lesson I, I like learn from feedback like that, which I've received, I would say in abundance over, over my career. Yeah. I think that's a great one. I think that will, that will resonate with a lot of people. I'm sure. What advice would you give someone, let's say they're, they're coming out of college and they look at the payments or or fintech industry, and they say, hey, I want to have a, a career in this industry. So maybe it's someone that you're hiring right out of school in, in, in your you know, current position. And you know, they come to you and say, hey, I want to build a career in payments. What do I need to do to be successful? What would you tell them? I mean, I would say, you know, first, do the research. Understand what payments is. It's um, when you look at the payment space, when you look at the fintech space, it is, it is large, it is complex but there is a lot going on. So I would say, try to be more specific than just saying you're interested in in payments, right? Really figure out what area you think is interesting, who are the major players in those spaces that you think are interesting, who are the tertiary influencers that are disrupting the way in which money moves, right? So so definitely do do your homework there. I would also say that once you get a job, right? So somebody starting here, I, I think my my advice to them would be do the work, right? That it is a really complicated industry and understanding how things get made, how sort of the money moves, like understand the details. It's really, really important and super helpful over your career to kind of understand how the sausage is made. Even if that means that as it likely will be, because you're in a kind of beginner job, that the work itself may be kind of mundane. The work itself may be a little boring, but, you know, so it may not be the most glamorous work, but like learn the details of the business because it'll just pay enormous dividends, right? Because you'll know how things operate and that will really help you as you kind of move up up the ranks. So that would be sort of the the second thing. I think that the third thing would be know the business in terms of the customers, your numbers, the tech, right? Like, just get to understand all of those dynamics. And, you know, particularly, and I, again, for somebody like me, like particularly get to know the customers, you know, 
and do that by talking to customers, do that by talking to sales teams, do that by going on you know, the various online forums, you know, following social media, like really, really get to understand the customers. Because that all of these things will help educate you as a new kind of leader in payments, but it'll also enable you to think more strategically about the business and, you know, come up with really creative ideas that will help you in your job. I think that's all very, very good advice. Well, let's wrap up with one final question. Talk about what Clover slash Fiserv is doing, you know, to help and, you know, foster an environment where, you know, women can bring their full selves to work and be successful. Yeah. I mean, overall, I would say Fiserv is just a super impressive company when it comes to its commitment to to diversity. I mean, just to share at all levels of the organization, just to share some fun facts here, because I think it's really sort of great and relevant to your question. You know, in 2022, 46% of our U.S. workforce was female and 30% of our U.S. vice presidents and above. So people who are in leadership roles in the U.S. and 28% globally, which is a phenomenal statistic, are women. Now, Am I satisfied at 28 or 30, 30%? No, <laughs> but you know, it's the growth is just tr- tremendous because we continue to see year over year increases in the percentage of women in leadership. And these statistics and these sort of fun facts like don't happen by accident, right? Our company is just really committed to building power, you know, like powerful solutions and recognizes that having a diversity of, of background and thought and experience and certainly gender is key to making sure that we have the best solutions. And so we have really an impressive group, I would say, of extremely talented, smart, and hardworking people here. And a significant portion of them are are women. And to further their opportunities, we have programming throughout the company. We have women in tech. We have our, our Women's Impact Network, which is an employee relationships group. We also have this amazing program called Leading, which is a Leading Women program. That is like a, I think it's almost a, a year long or six month long program for women to have like a learning agenda. And it's just a phenomenal program for, for women to develop like critical skills to enhance their professional professional growth. Those are the types of, you know, just to give you a sense of the types of things that that Fiserv does that, you know, obviously as part of Fiserv, you know, Clover and women in Clover participate in. Well, Andrea, we've covered a lot of ground about Clover and you and sort of, you know, your view on advice and women leaders. Is there anything else you'd like to go over before we wrap up? No, I, I think, listen, I think that the the payments space is an extremely exciting one. I think that the point of sale space, I would venture to say, is even more exciting because it includes payments as, as well as so much more. And I think that, listen, I think it's always been a space where women have flourished and it's great to see the trends to just continuing. So I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you during your Women Leaders in Payments Month about both. Great. Well, I know your time's very valuable, so I really appreciate you being on the show today. Oh, it was great talking with you, Greg. Thanks so much. Thank you. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 